My older daughter used to go to school on skateboard last year, and, and the kids tend to test the different mobility modes and then seeing what fits their needs and their lifestyles and their identity. Um, so that's been very cool to watch as a neighborhood effort. Um, and I also think that the parents, when they know that their kids are cycling and riding um, a scooter, they tend to drive a little bit slower because it's always not someone else's kid. If it's my kid, I'm gonna look out for other kids and I can feel that um, happening around as well. Uh, so it's a more like a developing an ecosystem. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town Channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Dr. Natalia Barber back on the podcast once again. Uh, we're going to be getting an update from her from her new home in Orlando, Florida. Uh, it is a good one, but it is long. So let's get right to it with Dr. Natalia Barber. Natalia, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast once again. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And again, shout out to everyone who watched the last episode. I know time is scarce and I really appreciate everyone's time um, who decided to spend it with us. Yes, absolutely. Um, and what I love to have my uh, guests do is just kind of introduce themselves to the audience. So uh, take this moment to you know just kind of quickly introduce uh, who you are. Who is Natalia? Well, I am an assistant professor at the University of Central Florida, and I specialize in transportation, smart cities, travel behavior, and safety. I did my PhD at the University of South Florida, my postdoc at MIT, and then I was for a brief moment, uh, less than two years, close to it, at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And now I'm back in the US, so there has been some traveling. <laughs> Just a little bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, a little bit of the logistical uh, challenge of, of moving a family of four, you know, around. <laughs> yeah, just swapping continents a couple of times, but I mean, who's counting? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and so how long have you been uh, uh, back in Florida now? Almost exactly one year. Almost exactly one year. Okay, fantastic. And and, and we do our best to, to you know, really welcome, you know, folks back to the United States. So when, when you uh, when you made it back to the United States, uh, you were rudely uh, welcomed with uh, a hurricane. <laughs> Hello, Ian. Yes. That was Hurricane Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was Hurricane Ian the first month uh, yeah. after we moved back. And although we lived in Tampa for quite a few years, you know, they don't happen that often that that's what you expect in your first couple of weeks of moving back. It was an eye opening experience, although I did have experience to cycle in the rain in the Netherlands. No, I did not go cycling in that. This is yeah. 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 two levels above my comfort yeah. zone. Well, I mean, one of the, 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 the biggest joke too, of course, uh, you know, when it comes to bike riding, riding bikes in the Dutch is that so often people are going, oh yeah, but it's flat there and oh, it's not very, very hot, you know, and it doesn't get all that cold. So there's always these excuses, but it, it's windy there. It, it blows and it rains there and they just keep riding through it. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you know what? I feel like I'm starting to explain for the other side of extreme cycling in Florida, because it's over 100 degrees, 80, 90% of humidity. And we're going to talk about it um, in this episode. So from one extreme, the hail and the rain and the wind to humidity and yeah. heat waves. And, and yeah, and, and blue skies. And so you, you, you traded that that rain uh, and, and, and that environment. And then this is the sky. Now, is this the downtown Orlando area? Yes, it's downtown Orlando, and I must admit, I do not come and visit very often because we live about 20 minutes outside in this little neighborhood called Lake Nona. Uh. So everything we need is within that neighborhood, and we chose it very strategically uh, to be able to drop the kids off and, you know, do our daily errands. So I still have to explore more of downtown Orlando, although there are a few pictures from my explorations in the past. 
Interesting. Okay. And are the, the campus that you're at, are you at the main campus? Yes, I'm at the main campus about 20 minutes from where I live, but I do a hybrid. I work a little bit from home on my research and then I go to campus for the meetings, which is all working out very well okay. for me. And then cycling okay. yeah, during the day. Yeah. Kids, yeah. So now, now, now I have my bearings. And so, uh, so yeah, Lake Nona is down here in the, uh, uh, in the little red squiggles down by the, uh, Orlando airport. And then up here is, uh, where the star is, is, is kind of where the university campus is. It's one of the biggest university campuses, uh, in the entire United States. I was blown away by how massive it is. It is, it is very big with almost 70,000 students. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So you can, when you enter the campus, you can definitely see how enormous it is. And you think you're there, but then you have still have to drive for a few more minutes to make it to your building. But what surprised me, uh, of course, I'm not going to create this narrative that Orlando is a heaven for pedestrians and bicycles. But I will do point out that there are amazing people here who tend to push the narrative that it is possible, change is possible. And when I got to campus, I didn't really know what exactly to expect. And then I saw a lot of people on their skateboards, uh, e-scooters and bicycles. It's not at the scale that it's done in more cyclable, walkable communities, but it is visible enough to notice. Right. Yeah. And in fact, you, you have a couple of photos here, you know, of uh, campus and the fact that, yeah, we, we've got some, we've got some bikes, you know there, you know, it's not fair to compare to TU Delft. I mean, TU Delft has uh, one of the busiest cycle tracks in all of the Netherlands that goes right into campus. And, and it's something that I've filmed multiple times over the years. And, and so, yeah, it's, we can't compare. <laughs> it's not fair to compare that way. But what I will say is I was, I was very impressed with very early on after after you arrived uh you know in orlando and sort of settling in uh, to this i started seeing images uh from you of that like this of of the tremendous network of pathways uh that you know is there in that environment talk about this you know how how much of a lifeline has this been for that transition because we talked about it in the first episode uh, first time I had you on about culture shock. And so I, I'm sure there you you went through a little bit of a culture shock, uh, you know, coming back to Florida from Delft. Uh, but then you you had access to some of this stuff that must have helped. Yes. And my experience in the Netherlands has shifted a lot of um, expectations for day to day operations in the U.S. So when we were coming back, I knew exactly what I want for my kids that I don't want to be stuck in the car line. So we chose this area just because it has bike lanes and they're multi-use so that they're for pedestrians and cyclists and uh, kids who go on e-scooters to school. So of course, for North American standards, it's very bikeable, very walkable. That's my daughter on scooter. And I must admit, because of the heat waves, both of the kids have e-scooters now. Uh, so on the hottest days, they go to school on their e-scooters and they absolutely love it. So we switch between bikes and e-scooter and walking. So I was very impressed with how this new neighborhood, and it's above, uh, about maybe 10, 15 years old, how it's been developed. Yes, shout out to Coach Bato, <laughs> almost a bike bus. We're, we're starting here, something new. Yeah. yeah. Um, and. I was very impressed how this area was developed with a thought of well-being and access. We have little downtown that uh, is completely accessible via bike lane. And it's almost, uh, you, I mean, you have to cre cross a few streets, but other than that, you can just keep cycling or, or scooting. And then we have also autonomous shuttle in the neighborhood. So in addition to all these crazy micromobility modes, there is that autonomous shuttle on demand that you can get in the app and you can request and it comes. Oh, we we'll, got to we'll talk come, about we'll that. We'll come back well, to the alligators definitely. later. Yeah. We have a photo. There it is. 
Yes. yes. So that's where it picks you up and then you hop on and then it takes you to our little downtown area. It's not very big, but there are a few restaurants, a few places to visit. Um, and it goes really slow for an ounce and there is an attendant on board. So it's still in the uh, very early stages. But that's a testing bed for new technology, which also has been a nice perk to experience, you know, just hopping on and off autonomous shuttle. Yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting too, because, uh, you know, one of the other things that you, you have in this area or in this segment of, of photos is, um, you've got the autonomous shuttle, but then you also experienced the uh, sensation of, uh, the golf cart culture that exists. And so you've got your golf yeah. carts here. Yes. So this is Halloween, believe it or not. And all these golf carts, they're part of your costume. So it's, it's, it's a vibe, literally. And then for Christmas, the, you, most of them are electric. For Christmas, there's a golf cart parade through the neighborhood. And a lot of parents, because those are small, I mean, small, low speed neighborhood streets. A lot of parents drop off their kids at school in golf carts. And I know there has been a lot of discussion in the usage and applicability and improvements to mobility of golf carts in low speed neighborhoods and on low speed streets. So yeah, so that's that's Halloween. Uh, it's out of control, completely out of control. Nothing I've ever seen before. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Once again, culture shock. <laughs> again, reverse. <laughs> reverse culture shock. <laughs> uh, it, it's also uh, notable that you're you're right there next to Disney World too, and and Epcot and 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 all of that. So these are like in your backyard. Yeah, so we're in the Disney backyard, and it's also a big part of everyone's afternoons. So you just go to Disney, uh, watch the fireworks that uh, what a lot of families do. Um, and it's been very wonderful to have the experience and being able to experience this so frequently because, you know, Orlando metropolitan area is filled with amusement park, amusement parks, and there are more of them than we're even capable of visiting, but we're slowly going down the list and maybe in a few years we'll be able to see more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and quickly, I, I noticed that you, you very quickly befriended some of the, the local neighbors uh, here. <laughs> so here's the thing. You don't only have to worry about your pets and kids being hit by a car. Now you have to worry about them being attacked by an alligator. And although this is very rare, you probably have higher probability of getting struck by lightning. It's still a very unique view that you have when you walk around your neighborhood because those are the retention ponds. They're mostly man-made for the hurricanes and the rainfall to get the water to not flood the neighborhoods. But then here or there you have some friendly or unfriendly reptile come out. Um, they're absolutely gorgeous. I am truly amazed by how massive they are and, and how beautiful. Yeah, here's one. And, and for the listening only audience, uh, w these are a couple of photos of, uh, again, some of the local, um, some of the local wildlife, uh, a couple of uh, medium sized alligators. <laughs> if That's you're not used to seeing them regularly, even the little one seems a little bit, a little bit outside of your comfort zone. But yes, they're not the, the biggest ones that you can see in the wild yet. So I do want to go back to uh, the bike bus uh, uh, photo here, and, and this is basically a, almost a bike bus, and a shout out to, again, Sam Balto, Coach Sam Balto, who has been on the Active Tense channel, uh, gosh, uh, several times now since he came to visit here in, in Austin. I took him for a bike ride uh, here in, in the Austin area. Um, talk a little bit about that, though, from the standpoint of uh, what you're experiencing and what the kids are experiencing in terms of, uh, you know, if they so choose to be able to, to ride their bike to school or anywhere else for that matter, because it, it, bike bus doesn't just have to be about getting to school. It can be about, you know, kids having the freedom to go pretty much wherever they want. 
having that designated infrastructure to schools um, and connecting neighborhoods, of course, it's not at the scale that you can see it in a very uh, cyclable cities, but it's enough for us to go from point A to point B without major interruptions is life changing for the kids, particularly for us, you know, the route to school, when you see that car line and my kids are just like boom, boom. Um, and for that matter, there are a lot of kids who walk and uh, bike to school and e-scoot uh, from the little ones, from the elementary school up to the high school, because that's how that community was designed. So it gives them the freedom, not even to mention that there are studies that say that if kids walk, bike or have moderate commute or moderate um, activity in the morning, it increases their cognitive performance at school. So in addition to the physical activity that they get in the morning, they get to wake up, we get to talk, uh, check in every morning. They also arrive to school refreshed. So we are very much maintaining the Dutch lifestyle. Yeah, I love it. And uh, and again, for the listening audience, we're looking at a photo here of your daughter on a bike. Um, and the, the pathway that she's on is just this really nice, comfortable, ultra wide, I'm assuming it's a multi-use path. Um, but as I understand it, there's a whole network of these pathways, uh, you know, throughout your neighborhood, as well as throughout many of the neighborhoods in the Orlando area. Uh, yes, particularly in our region, they are connected to grocery stores. Uh, for example, if you have to go to a doctor or a dentist, you can hop on your bike and go. There are not that many people riding yet, um, but I do hope that over time it will become more and more popular. And I really see the change. So when we arrived last year, uh, I think there were only there was only one cargo bike. We got the second one, and now I see at least four or five more. And I know I don't I don't, I don't want to pat myself on the back and be like, okay, we're we're the change. Exactly. So we put our kids on the back on the days that we're really running behind and like rushing to school. But I think there's something about people adopting new transportation modes and the neighbors seeing it and like, okay, if they're doing it, we're going to do this. And it slowly starts to trickle in. And every time I go or every month, I'm like, are there more kids on bikes going to school? So I do have that impression. Maybe it's a wishful thinking or maybe the change is slowly happening. Yeah. And this particular photo is uh, uh, your cargo bike parked in front of the coffee shop. Uh, and so, yeah, being able to uh, jump on that bike and be very conspicuous of about doing it, uh, but not in your face. It's not like, you know, preaching or shouting out that you're doing it. You're just kind of going about your life and, and, you know, doing some normal routine things that you got used to doing in Delft you try to continue doing and there's that attractant. And this is something that um, uh, Brandon Lust, uh, American Feetzer and I talk about is that concept of, you know, just getting out there and doing it. And uh, when you're on a, especially a cargo bike, people stop and talk to you and, and want to know more because there is that curiosity factor of, wow, you mean you can do this stuff without being in a car? Tell me more. Yeah. And then uh, people literally stop my daughter and I when we ride. I'm like, that's a cool bike. She looks so comfortable. Uh, here was our trip to the grocery store. Still a minority, but we're working on it. Orlando is working on it. Um, and it's been a pretty wonderful experience. And I know there is this notion here or there that if you want to live a bikeable lifestyle, you should move to Europe. And if everyone moved to Europe, there would be no change ever happening. So of course, we can only do it at the scale that we are allowed to. I still drive, um, and it's impossible not to drive in a North American city, at least most of them. Um, but not all the trips need to be drivable. So for those that I don't have to drive, I just hop on my bike or I walk. I am still considering the e-scooter because of the kids now, so maybe I'll just uh, switch in between. But there are different ways of getting to do your daily er errands. Yeah. And, and since we're talking about, um, you know, going and doing the daily things, uh, I will prove and, and, and validate for the audience here that uh, one of the things that you experienced a lot when you were in Delft, of course, is the rain. And we have 
proof here that it does rain in Orlando as well. And we also have proof that your children do not dissolve in rain. So they will not melt. Yes, you don't <laughs> dissolve in the rain in Delft. And the same in North America, it's validated uh, by experience. And then you see the people blurred in the background. They're also not dissolved. So it is very much, it's much it, it holds true for all continents. So highly recommend. <laughs> yes, highly recommend. You can, you, can, you can walk in the rain, you can bike in the rain. And uh, I, I was going to say, I, I was going to the, they're so blurry in the background. I was thinking maybe they were dissolving, but you, you verify <laughs> no, no. they're not. Yeah. yeah. OK, <laughs> that's just the camera. <laughs> well, it, this has been so cool just kind of catching up and, and uh, you know, really sort of understanding what that transition has been like for you. Uh, but we're also going to talk a little bit about work and, and some of the fun stuff that you've been doing. So you have been. Uh, very, very busy getting up to speed with your, I'm sure your teaching duties as well as uh, research. Tell us more about what you've been up to. Yes, uh, I always say that I am a full-time biker and a full and a half-time researcher. So I've been very busy in research and I am not going to talk about all my research, but the research that particularly relates to um Cycling, happiness, uh, bicycle helmets. Yes, we will talk about bicycle helmets and research that we recently published. I know it's controversial, um, but we will try to be as scientific and objective as possible. So there are a few papers that I recently published. The first one was on happiness and cycling, and the other one was um, on previously mentioned bicycle helmets. So in the first one, we looked at whether people are more or less likely to cycle after the pandemic. And the research was published with Professor Mannering, and we developed an advanced statistical and econometric modeling to see and observe and capture the shifts in cycling. And then our sample, uh, we had 7,421 responses. So it's a large sample. It came from open data source. And even when we looked at the descriptive statistics, we found that 14% of the respondents stated that they will cycle more after the pandemic, compared to only four who responded that they will cycle less. So that's a huge difference just over a relatively short period of time. And the survey also asked about the reasons, and they were very interesting, why people have shifted their mobility or their willingness to cycle more after the pandemic. And out of those um, 14%, which accounts for a over, slightly over 1,000 um, respondents, 555 said that they realized they liked biking. So what happened, essentially, what I can speculate, that during COVID, people were able to experience and start using modes that they would normally not use for a variety of reasons, period of infection, open streets, uh, less car traffic. So then they experienced cycling and they're like, oh, we really like it, which is very optimistic. The second reason is um, the second most frequently chosen reason, perhaps that it should be stated, was that they plan to bike more in, they in their neighborhoods, which goes back to the open street initiatives. So in our sample, we found that that actually has worked, that people are willing to travel locally on their bikes. And the last one goes to finances. And the people um, who responded said that they found cycling as being an inexpensive way to travel. So when I looked at these three reasons, uh, most frequently chosen ones, I was like, wow, I mean, such a huge change in such short period of time, because that was just during the pandemic, so relatively short. And then we also looked at who changed and what were the shifts among the respondents. And interestingly, historically, women tend to cycle less. But we found that after the pandemic, we were able to capture a shift particularly of women without vehicles, that they will have higher probability to cycle, which is very optimistic because that's how they can meet their transportation needs. And if you think about one um, car in a household, that goes a lot of times, unfortunately, to one person. And sometimes it's not a woman. 
So that was one, hour, one of our findings. Um, the other one goes to utility uh, of cycling. Both workers, part-time and full-time, had a higher probability to cycle more. So perhaps people who started to cycle during the pandemic, they're like, okay, we really like it. We want to commute to work. So that's uh, also true for our model. And the last two of the interesting findings that I want to share, there are more and I highly recommend you a visit uh, and check out the paper, is are related to the psychology of cycling. So we found that people who tend to be environmentally friendly tend to have higher probability of cycling more after the pandemic, which is established in the literature. But the second one, that people who tend to be happy, so having a higher life satisfaction, also tend to cycle uh, more after the pandemic, which was a very extraordinary finding that I was able to confirm that statistically, that people with high level of life satisfaction will indeed have a higher probability of cycling. So that's in a nutshell, that research paper, it's much longer and I tried to condense it to, as, uh, to, to the most interesting points, uh, but it, it was, a very nice experience to be able to combine my passion for the environment with statistical models. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And yeah, I mean, it, it's really, I think it's really fascinating to think of the fact that, you know, we all were just without our permission <laughs> exposed to this massive experiment that was the COVID uh, experience with a pandemic happening. And so it, it really sort of gave us this this weird sort of life reset of, oh, well, what is our streets for? And, you know, and, and it was it was is very interesting, especially with it somewhat in the rear view mirror now to think about, OK, well, what has stuck and what has happened. And so it's, it's very encouraging and interesting to see the researchers, yourself included, and uh, and, and Fred as well you know, diving into this and trying to better understand, um, okay, well, what are people thinking? Are they holding on to this? And it'll be interesting to see too in, in another five years, you know, what's the long-term tail effect of, of this? Yes. And, you know, if you think about COVID, everyone was experiencing the same thing, meaning the government regulations, the lockdowns, whatnot. Of course, there are some differences because some of where some of the people were essential workers, whatnot. But overall, it was a very uniform playing field in terms of where you can, where you cannot go. And it didn't impact everyone the same way. So that's what we're proving. Even under the most similar conditions that we could possibly create in terms of mobility, and leaving places and accessing public transport and de decreased frequency, um, still people behaved differently. And that was the idea for us to capture how that evolved during the pandemic. And of course, we'll have to see in five years. Hopefully that will stick, that mobility will stick. What was the most surprising result of of this? Because, I mean, as a researcher, as an academic researcher, you don't necessarily go in with, uh, you know, a set set of, of, you know, thoughts necessarily. I mean, you're, you really are trying to, like, understand what the data is telling you. What was the, the biggest surprise that you that came out of it for you? I think the level of life satisfaction overall happiness as i call it although it wasn't defined in the survey as the happiness but overall level of life satisfaction that it was linked to increased probability in cycling post pandemic i think that tells us that transportation is so much more than just accessing your workplace or school or going to the grocery store it impacts your life and we didn't check that direction we only checked how our life satisfaction impacts the propensity to cycle. But it's that dual relationship that always has fascinated me, um, how you can go and be stuck in traffic and then be all angry about it, or you can just cycle to the grocery store and listen to the birds singing or even stop to smell the roses. So we're learning that transportation is not only about the travel, but it's also about public health. Um, about safety on the roads, about our mental well-being. So there's so much more that this, uh, that transportation defines. 
And it, it brings it brings back to my mind our, our first conversation as well. And I wanted to bring this this up is that uh, if we do a little snapshot of uh, where we're at on your your first uh, episode is in fourth place, uh, of course, behind Jason Slaughter with not just bikes, uh, his his three appearances on the uh, on the channel here. Um, yeah, you're at twenty one thousand views. But the reason I, I want to hone in on this is. The, the thumbnail and what I named the thumbnail was freedom and joy. And so that kind of taps into what you were just talking about is I think that experience that, you know, sort of came out, you were looking at happiness and, and people sort of gravitated towards this, this bike, you know, this, this thing that we kind of all remember from our childhood. But, and part of the reason why there's fond memories of it is it expressed freedom and joy for us. Talk a little bit about that. Did that really kind of bubble up and come through in the study? Uh, yes, definitely. And another reason for writing the study is, you know, when you're on Twitter, you get different comments and different responses. And I try to stay away from engaging um, because it's very difficult to change someone's opinion in 240 characters. So I decided to take the approach of writing and publishing research to actually make a substantial shift and make even maybe not even substantial, but incremental shift in what people study, what they find, what is science behind cycling, and why is it even worth to study? Um, because our life well-being and our life uh, satisfaction are all linked to this. And that was the primary objective of this work to prove that it's about freedom, about the joy, and it's definitely worth exploring further. Yeah. And in fact, you mentioned Twitter and earlier today, or I guess this was yesterday, you, you posted this out on what used to be formally known as Twitter now is X. <laughs> um, apologies, Elon, apologies. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, but you, it's, you also said it's not about how fast you go, but it's who you're going with. And these are qualitative measures when we talk about freedom and joy and happiness and, and interacting with our community and interacting with our loved ones. It's, it's not about how fast you're going. It really is about, you know, who you're with and, and that experience that you're able to have. Yes. That was a moment yesterday. We're going out to dinner. I'm powered by dessert. My daughter is powered by electricity. It will all even out at the end. Uh, but it was, such an amazing experience for our family as a whole unit. And then there was my husband and my older daughter uh, riding behind us. So we get to have these experiences and look at the fields that seasons changing. That's something that you feel you're a part of as opposed to watching through a glass as you travel in a car. Um, so it is shifting um, family dynamics in a way because of those little micro moments that you get to experience throughout your day. Yeah. Well, since I do have uh, Twitter X on my screen right now, I'm going to shift gears and uh, highlight the fact that you are currently hiring a PhD student, yes. uh, or at least you were as of uh, uh, the, the 15th of, of August. Uh, is that still the case? Are you still looking for a PhD student? Yes. Let me do some PR. Come work with me. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, so if you're interested, I am hiring a PhD a student. I will start reviewing applications in the fall. So in a few weeks, it will be still open for about three to four weeks. Um, and then I'm going to review the CVs and start um, doing interviews. So if you're interested to work on safety and travel behavior, I highly recommend apply. All the information is in front of you or you can just send me an email. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing and, it up, John. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My my, my pleasure. Uh, when do you think you'll start uh, reviewing those applications? In about three, four weeks. In so three or four weeks, okay. So sometime in the end of September. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of September. Okay, very good. Excellent. Yay, that's awesome. I saw that and I was like, oh, we got to talk about that. <laughs> that's fun. Is this going to be your first PhD student uh, there at uh, UCF or, or is this... Yeah. Uh, Okay, very good. Yeah, my first as a first supervisor, not as a committee member. That's one of the most meaningful things that you can do as a scientist to help educate and to be a part of someone else's journey. 
And I don't know if I've mentioned it before. I don't think so. I've wanted to be a professor since I wanted, since I was like eight years old. So having this privilege to watch someone make that journey and graduate with their PhD or a master's degree and uh, write papers with them, I think it's the funnest part of my job. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, so let's pop on over and talk a little bit about uh, the helmet study that you did. Um, I usually, because helmets are so triggering in so many ways, I usually uh, take the time to mention that, uh, you know, my helmet use is always context sensitive. Um, I'm in a, I have the privilege and fortune of living in a neighborhood where i um, I don't feel as if where I need to ride to is a dangerous trip. And so I choose not to wear my helmet on that trip. Very similar to a Dutch approach to using a helmet. However, if I'm on my mountain bike or if I'm on my racing bike, um, I always wear my helmet. So it's very context sensitive. The other thing that I take a, a moment to pause and say is that I don't care what you do. If you want to wear a helmet, wear a helmet. I don't care if you don't want to wear a helmet and you don't wear a helmet. That, that's fine. Just That's cool. What I have issue with is when people uh, start blaming and shaming people. And so, you know, I, I just put that out there ahead of time to, to let, you know, folks know, you know, don't even go there. And if you start victim blaming and you start, you know, shouting at people, you know, I, I silence those criticisms on my cha channel because I find them to be disruptive. And as a public health person, uh, it doesn't serve our purposes because, you know, as, as you will share from your meta-analysis, uh, there's some good information here, but at the same time, we also know from a public health uh, actuarial perspective is that there's some negative externalities to requiring people wear helmets and just the dangerization of, you know, presenting riding a bike as something that is, you know, needing to have safety equipment. Uh, I like to joke and say, yeah, I, I fall frequently um, and, and oftentimes I'm wondering, you know, since when I'm falling, I, I probably should have a helmet, but the context is I'm usually trail running when I trip and fall. And I'm like, well, that's probably the most likely time I'm going to hit my head is when I'm out doing a trail run. I'm not going to wear a helmet when I'm doing my trail run. <laughs> okay. So dive into this study that you did and explain for those people who may not know, what is a meta-analysis? Yes, I, I'll explain everything we've done in this study. So here's the reason why, one of the reasons we decided to do this study, and it's done with uh, Carlson Booth, who is a student or perhaps graduated uh, recently, uh, Dr. Atti and, and myself. And the idea that I had in my head uh, was because I was not in favor of helmets. I was very much in no, I think it's all the infrastructure, and it is there. A big part of it is infrastructure. So, of course, taking the infrastructure out. I wanted to see, particularly, let's say, in a hypothetical situation, you ride your bike on an empty road and you fall. And there's no impact, there's no dangerous situation, there's no vehicle. Will that helmet really make a difference at such low speed? So that was where that curiosity uh, came from. And of course, my experience in, uh, of living in the Netherlands and then living in the US and seeing how different countries approach that helmet paradigm. So this uh, is a literature review paper. So we did not do meta-analysis, but what we did, we reviewed others and compiled their findings. So we looked at different studies and we talk about different ways to even assess the effectiveness of helmets. And one of them is a case control study. Um, that's where you compare the outputs of cyclists with and without helmets. The other one is a cohort study where you follow a group of people. Then it's before, after, and that's what you just mentioned. When there is a helmet policy, how does the after look like after the helmet policy, the mandatory helmet policy was implemented. And the last one is the meta-analysis that combines multiple studies and multiple regions. So it looks at crashes that happen in 
the US, Australia, Netherlands, Poland, and it tries to look for um, high level findings. And we examined multiple meta analyses in our paper. And we find that particularly in all cases, actually, in all cases, helmets were found effective to decrease injury. Even if you're just riding your cycle, you're riding your, your bike by yourself on a bike path and you do not hit or you do not, you're not hit by any vehicle. Uh, some studies say that head injuries decrease by 60%. And of course, we're not talking here about the infrastructure that prevents the injuries from happening. We're talking about the cases that you have to cross the road, even on a very safe infrastructure, and you interact a vehicle. And their helmets are essentially very important to decrease the fatal and serious in head injuries. So those are usually um, a result of a crash between a cyclist and a higher speed motor vehicle, uh, because those are the highest injury uh, severities. So that basically was our finding that they are effective. They will not, of course, um, it's not about the infrastructure. We did not take that part into consideration. But what it's, the study has changed is even in my neighborhood, I initially did not have my kids wear helmets because it's a separated path. But after I did this study with my co-authors, I changed my mind because I said, if I have all this evidence, because they have to cross the street, they, to, it's not super continuous. You have to cross and there is a potential interaction and the drivers don't necessarily expect a lot of cyclists or pedestrians. So in case they don't see my kids, they have a higher chance of decreasing the injury severity. But as you said, I fully agree. And again, this was a scientific uh, f data and scientific findings. Now we're switching to my opinion because those are two different. There is uh, me as a scientist and there is me as a parent and a human being. So I do agree with you that it's context specific. If I was personally cycling on a shared road with vehicles that tend to go higher speeds, I'm wearing that helmet. If I'm cycling here and I'm, I, I'm generally risk averse, so I stop, I don't take risks. I don't wear a helmet and it's my choice. And everyone, as you said, is entitled to that choice. However, scientific findings say that even in cases that there's less risk in case you were hit by a vehicle or by the driver who's not paying attention, you have higher chances of reducing your head injury. And in, in recently, we, we've been seeing, uh, even, even just in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, really kind of stratifying where, from a global perspective, from a public health perspective, where protective uh, equipment, um, injury prevention and protective equipment shows up in a hierarchy of priorities. And we see that it, it's like, it's the, really, it, it becomes the, uh, the last resort, what we really need to be doing is making safer environments. And that's, that's the infrastructure that's really creating an environment where, uh, those dangerous interactions are much less likely to occur. And then that, that final step, once you have, you know, those things taken care of is, oh, okay, I can now make my choice of, you know, do I choose to wear any protective equipment or not. And again, my biggest beef that I have in, in terms of the dialogue that ends up happening is, you know, where, you know, that dialogue, that discussion goes is, is, Oh, a, a, a crash occurred. And it's like, Oh, but did, was the pedestrian distracted? Were they wearing high vis clothing? Did they have appropriate lighting? Uh, did a person on a bike, what was the person wearing a helmet or not? To me, that's just straight off victim blaming. And so I, I don't really have much tolerance for that. I, I fully agree. It's like you, you have your watch stolen. No one is asking you, why did you wear your watch? Um, and in the, the message that we were trying to put out is that if you are in situations where there is a high probability of unsafe crossings or unsafe interactions, 
they can make a difference. And that was, again, the primary objective of the study, which I think that if you don't read the entire paper, you may get the wrong impression, but I'm here to clarify that infrastructure comes first and then it's the protective equipment. So we're definitely on the same page. But also, last point I forgot to make, we also looked at lab studies, like in the lab, like for testing. And we found that helmets, helmet is not equal to a helmet. And usually they use, uh, the, the testing uses 50% men head size and the body uh, dimensions. So the shape of the head and the size plays a role in how protective a, helm a helmet can be. But the testing and the designs are done for men's 50% head. So there's some serious equity issue that we were able to capture in that domain that I wanted to point out as that was also an important finding of our study. Uh, yeah, there's still work that needs to be done. There's And there's entire uh, papers that go into exactly what is tested, how it is tested. And uh, if you really want to go down that deep, dark rabbit hole, there's a, a lot of eye-opening things that take place. Uh, and in fact, most helmet manufacturers will literally tell you that it has not been tested. These, these products have not been tested um, and been proven to uh, protect somebody in a collision with an automobile. Um, and that's their little, you know, fine print that they have there because it's true. They didn't actually test that mainly because it would be impossible for them to do that test. <laughs> so, um, risk. exactly. And, and risky too. Now you've also written a chapter recently. So talk about this. Yes. Yeah, so this is the environmental side of transportation that, uh, I was able to contribute to. I wrote a chapter 10. It's on transport and the environment. That's the textbook that is designed for undergraduate level students that uh, who are just entering the transportation research and want to learn more. The book has multiple chapters on different topics from policy, um, some safety, and then uh, environment, of course. So in the book chapter, I point out several areas of the biggest emissions and then, of course, uh, try to encourage cycling as an alternative to decreasing those emissions and also emphasize the non-emission pollution, which come from heavy truck tires or SUV tires that heat up and then the cars go really fast and then there's increased pollution. So I also talk about the other side of uh, negative um, environmental impacts of transportation, particularly focusing on automobiles. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because uh, that's usually the, the thing we think about typically when we think about um, uh, pollution and the, uh, well, climate. And when we think of global warming, we think of, okay, yeah, CO2 and the emissions. So we're thinking tailpipe emissions. But in, in reality, um, if we just go, you know, electrify the entire motor vehicle fleet, we're still going to be in a challenge. A, we still have the safety challenge that's out there. If we're just you're replacing internal combustion engines with uh, electrification engines, uh, but you still have the 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 issue of motor vehicles. Cars are still cars. <laughs> These big trucks, you know, they're still trucks, and so you still have the challenge of congestion. You still have the challenge of traffic. You still have the challenge of risks of injury uh, to a squishy, soft humans uh, that are out there, as well as car-on-car -car collisions that, that take place. Um, but the other thing that takes place is what you just mentioned there too briefly, which is the fact that with these heavier vehicles, um, electrified vehicles, you, you still have the particulate matter, the ultrafine particles coming off of the tire wear, as well as brake wear. And uh, so you still have a lot of uh, externalities, unintended consequences, if you will, of continuing uh, from the motor fleet. And so I like to say, yeah, we, we need to electrify our motor fleet, our motor vehicle fleet, but we also need to decrease the number of vehicles on the roads. Yes. And I also bring it uh, in the book that I found one research that looked at pollution from tailpipes, uh, like the particularly CO2, and then projected 
how it's going to go over the next decades. And the graph started to go down at some point because of all the policies and regulations that have been made to uh, remove fossil fuels from powering our vehicles. But there is the other side of the story that the particulate matter and the brake uh, dust and the non-emission related uh, pollution is hugely unregulated. And that's one of the issues that even if we can, what you just mentioned, if we can get rid of the CO2 emissions, it's still very difficult without the right policy tools and regulations to bring down the other types of emissions. And there's some estimates that uh, that plastic from tires is, you know, the microplastic is in the oceans and that, that number is very worrying. Uh, one study talked about it. So from my research that I did on the topic, this is not trivial, uh, however, still unregulated. So hopefully in the coming years, there'll be more emphasis put on uh, the other side of emissions. And then there's the noise emission, the heavier oh, car. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's another thing. So there is a lot that can be done. Um, and of course, one of the solutions is decreasing driving, mode switch. It, it's, it is interesting, and I'm glad you mentioned noise there too, is that uh, sometimes we, we think of, oh, well, yeah, the noise of the motor vehicles. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the engine. It's the exhaust. It's, it's the acceleration. It's like, yeah, up to a certain level. But once cars get up to speed, it's really the friction noise. It's the noise of the tires that kind of takes over. And so, again, simply electrifying the fleet isn't going to deal with all of the noise pollution uh, because the heavier the vehicle uh, is, the, the louder that noise is as well on the roads. Absolutely. And the higher the speed. Um, and there, yeah. I think there is a graph in the book where I actually show that at some point there is a little difference. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What else have we not yet talked about that you want to leave the audience with in the last uh, 10 minutes or so? I think we talked about it all. I think we can keep it short and sweet this time because last time... Oh, I've got more for you. I mean, oh, I want to for- I, I know about the <laughs> snow in Orlando. What's up with this? <laughs> uh, yeah, this uh, is Orlando and it's snowed. I mean, it's... <laughs> As is much this as fake? it could. No, is this fake or is this a snowstorm? <laughs> the snow is real. It just didn't okay. fall on the ground. It was brought okay. in. It was brought um, in. <laughs> <laughs> the kids loved it. The kids loved so, it. So tell, tell the story and describe <laughs> this for uh, the listening our audience, what we're looking at here. So what you're looking at is a, uh, it's like a s- tubing or a slide, like a, longer slide covered with snow where it's mostly ice at the ice at this point and the kids got tubes and they were able to experience uh sliding in their shorts and and short sleeve uh, shirts down this hill and it was wonderful it was one of those community events that we attended and yeah it was <laughs> it was something else definitely yeah i mean but, but it, what's really really kind of cool about you know, those types of experiences is, again, it, it just, it brings forward that, that sense of joy and fun. And I think that's incredibly important for us to, to, to hold on to when we think about the opportunities that we have of, of normalizing what it means to get around in our community and to be able to get out on bikes. And you mentioned, you know, just how incredibly important this is that we're able to shift some of those shorter vehicle trips away from the automobile and be able to make more of them by walking and biking and using transit. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're looking at a photo here of uh, your, your kids' bikes or, or one of, is that your cargo bike in the background? Yeah, that's yes, a cargo that's bike in the background. Bike. And the reason that my older kid is rarely in a picture because of the bikeable, walkable infrastructure, she gets all the freedom so she can get to school by herself, come back by herself. So uh, I don't have to be very involved in the drop-offs and pickups, which also decreases emissions. Because when I look at the car line that is just idling in front of the schools where the air should be the cleanest, uh, you know, so... That's the that's the benefit to 
those psychopaths. Um, and here we were going out, just out and about, and there were cows. So we stopped, looked at the cows. And it's incredible how much kids can learn through these daily operations that seem mundane, but there's always a learning opportunity, uh, something new to see, something new to experience, which wouldn't be available to us otherwise. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that as a mom, as a parent, how impactful and how important is it to, you know, to be able to see your kids be able to develop that sense of autonomy and freedom and, and and be able to become a a young adult, a young functioning adult in community by being able to get around to, to places. If you think about it, it's, Hardly ever only about transportation, but for example, when my older daughter, um, who's 13, so she's she's a real teenager now, uh, can rely on herself to get to places and she can go see her friends, she can coordinate her own life. It teaches her time management because she knows, oh, I have to leave at this time to make it to school on time, otherwise I'll be tardy. So it again, through this just re- it's not the parents i'm not saying okay kids get in the car we're gonna do car line it's on her so she is ending up gr- developing those skills without really much of us teaching her because it's a necessity that she makes it to school in time um so it's been pretty rewarding to see them getting that concept of time how much it takes and them being in charge as opposed to the parents organizing everything, uh, which I know that's the case these days, that the parents tend to uh, organize things. And we do. We do after school activities, whatnot, of course. Uh, I, I drive them to places uh, as well. But when I don't have to, it's fully on them. Yeah. And I think that's I, I, that's really, really interesting, too. And, and I really wanted to ask you that question because it's in North America, oftentimes it's just sort of assumed that as a parent and, and especially as a mom, that you're going to be, that's your sole role. It's like, oh, I'm going to be carting them around and doing all of this stuff. So being able to have a situation where um, they're able to develop that a sense of autonomy and the efficacy, the skills, the, the and, and feel confident that they can do that. Um, for your older daughter, is, is some of her friends getting around like this too? Or are they getting around under their own power? The entire neighborhood. Hardly ever uh, anyone, especially for middle school, she's in middle school. Uh, for elementary school, the parents are more hands-on. But for the middle school, there is that psychopath that leads to the middle school. I think at some point it gets congested, as congested as it can be in North American standards. And you can see some very creative micro mobility modes like a monorail, this monowheel, I don't know what's the proper name for it. A lot of e scooters, uh, skateboards. My older daughter used to go to school on skateboard last year. Um, and the kids tend to test different mobility modes and then seeing what fits their needs and their lifestyles and their identity. Um, so that's been very cool to watch as a neighborhood effort. Um, and I also think that the parents, when they know that their kids are cycling and riding um, a scooter, they tend to drive a little bit slower because it's always not someone else's kid. If it's my kid, I'm going to look out for other kids. And I can feel that um, happening around as well. Uh, so it's more like a developing an ecosystem as a whole. And one of the things that that I think about, too, is um, when it comes to equity and mobility is, you know, as we get older and, and uh, you sent along this particular photo here, and it reminds me of, of some of my graduate studies in gerontology of, of really looking at, you know, how empowering it is as we get older to still be able to get around to meaningful places. You're in Florida, so you're in the, the heat of this. <laughs> Pardon the pun, in the sense that you've got, uh, you know, a a graying and aging population all around you as well. Talk a little bit about that. And this will be our final word is it is is how important it is to have a network of systems that is truly all ages and abilities. This picture makes me particularly sad because it's taken out of the context. So if you saw the full picture it would be a six-lane arterial and this 
older gentleman cycling to a grocery store. And I think there's a better way to do it, um, giving them more space, more access right away, uh, so they're not endangered. While I do feel like our community where we live has been designed to accommodate children cycling, adults walking, when you step outside, which is the case for a lot of cities and communities, it's been often overlooked. And given the space that we have, especially if new communities are being built, why not? What's the reason? It, it's mind boggling. So for this older gentleman, I do think that um, elderly community deserves better, um, deserves more access, safer infrastructure, safer uh, laws that would make their travel safer because at some point you know you we outlive our ability to drive safely and i know there's i don't want to end on a negative note because i know there are a lot of wonderful people who specialize in that transport trying to even bring autonomous and automated vehicles to the elderly houses to bring them to the grocery store on you know or uh, the work is being done but not at the scale as it needs to yet, um, because there's still a lot of isolation and lack of access when it comes to elderly. Yeah, and for the the viewing or the listening audience here, uh, the picture on frame here is an older gentleman uh, on an adult-sized tricycle uh, on a very, very narrow, um, uh, probably just sidewalk. So it isn't that generous multi-use path. And of course, it's right next to a six-lane strode. Uh, which is not super comfortable. And, you know, we, like you said, we, we, they deserve better. And we uh, have that obligation as society to, you know, create neighborhoods that, you know, have safe and inviting all ages and abilities uh, facilities so that people can meet their daily needs uh, by walking, biking, using transit, and when they need to, uh, also being able to use a motor vehicle. So I, I think that's one of the, the, the main things that we talk about when we talk about freedom and joy is like also freedom of choice, you know, being able to have choice in terms of your mobility mode. Absolutely. It's a, uh, I, and I wrote it a um, couple of days um, on Twitter, um, X on X, I wrote it on X a couple of days ago, <laughs> that when new communities are being built, there's so much emphasis put on making them accessible with different routes and high speed routes, as opposed to bringing the things that they need to access to their communities. So I do hope that that's the direction that the new developments are going to be built with focus on well-being, health, walkability, and then again, driving as an option, not an obligation. You should not need a car to go pick up bread. This is what I believe in. This is an opinion, not science. No, I, I, I think that that boy, that's hard science right there. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot Doctor... back it up with citations. So. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Dr. Natalia Barber, the University of Central Florida. Thank you so very much for joining me here on the Active Towns podcast once again. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Keep on cycling. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Natalia Barber. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns Ambassador by supporting my efforts out on Patreon. Buy me a coffee, uh, YouTube, super thanks down below, <laughs> as well as buying things from the Active Town Store. Got some cool uh, Streets Are For People swag out there, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit. Every little bit helps and is much appreciated. So until next time, this is John signing off, wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.